Hi, this is Leonard Lopate. You're listening to WNYC On Demand. Podcasts, streaming, and MP3 downloads available when you want to listen at WNYC.org and iTunes. WNYC is supported by Austria and her coffee houses, where you can sip and plot a revolution like Trotsky, or probe the unconscious like Freud, or sketch a symphony like Mozart. Learn more at experienceaustria.com. If you're one of the millions of Americans headed out on a date this weekend, today's Please Explain is for you. We're going to talk about the etiquette of dating, everything from when and how to ask for a date to how to uh, decline in the nicest and kindest way, to break up in the nicest and gentlest possible way. And joining us are Diane Gotsman, a nationally recognized etiquette expert and the owner of the Protocol School of Texas, a company that specializes in executive and social etiquette training. Welcome back to our show, Diane. Thank you, Leonard. It's great to be here. And in our studio, Thomas P. Farley, a manners and lifestyle expert and author of What Matters Most. Welcome to our show. Thanks so much, Leonard. Great to be here. Now, does either of you know where the term dating comes from? Uh, I'm assuming that it it arises from setting uh, a date to meet. I think that's exactly where it comes from. There is not any hard and fast uh, definition, but it, it's waiting for the date, looking on your calendar for that date. But we set dates for all sorts of social obligations. There's, and we don't say, you know, we're, we're dating my parents next week. It's actually, you know, the word itself has Latin roots. Uh, it comes from the infinitive dare, which means to give. Um, so it took on the contemporary understanding that we have of dating in the 1920s. But it's a very Americanism. It's not something that you hear very much abroad. Where did the, the custom of dating as we know it in our culture come from? And when did courting leave off and modern dating begin? I think that prior to the 1900s, you know, women were wooed. They were courted by the man and her entire family. And, uh, you know, as time progressed and our and, and we progress as a society, you know, men started taking the woman outside of the home because there were more places to, to go. You know, there were pubs and there were dance halls. But, you know, it, it started the Victorian era is where the actual romantic love was first required. Before that, you know, in med- medieval times, they would just go to a different village and steal a woman. <laughs> so it's evolved. Well, in, in many cultures, marriages are arranged and the idea of just dating anyone would be inconceivable. So is this just a, a European thing or is something that grows out of uh, the, the, the cultures that have most influenced America? Well, I think certainly if you go to early colonial America, this, the same uh, strictures that would have applied in Europe would have applied here. Um, it really was, as Diane says, it was not until the, the dawn of the 20th century after the Victorian era – Um, where dating kind of took on the idea of romance, um, where the automobile becomes such a big part of culture, where the idea of being able to escape and go out to a place. Um, In fact, even the idea of going out, the term going out, um, refers to going out on the town. And that's a very automobile-era concept. Our audience is made up of people from of all orientations, ages, and stages in life. So we want to cover as many different aspects of dating etiquette as we can. Mm -hmm. But there are... I'm I'm assuming, overarching rules of behavior that could be said to govern dating, whether you're 15 or 90 years old, gay or straight, always unmarried, divorced or widowed, a single parent. I I may have left a couple of things out. Uh, But is, is that true? I think this is something we're seeing certainly now in large measure with the Internet, which has just completely transformed the way people... Uh, ask one another out, break up, um, for better or for worse, um, internet dating and uh, sites such as Facebook, which of course has its origins, if you've seen the social network, in the idea of bringing together people and, and a way of you know f- finding out who's available and who's not. What percentage of the people interested in dating are using the internet, internet dating services to meet? Do we know? I don't have the statistics. I don't know yeah, if Diane I, might. I don't know how those statistics pan out. And, you know, I think that more and more we're relying on that because our schedules are so very busy. And some, it, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Well, are there specific rules that apply to them before people ever meet face-to-face? I mean, other uh, than the fact that if you're going to lie about your age, you shouldn't lie too much. If you're going to supply a picture, you should at least make it fairly recent. 
I think what it, you know, certainly when it comes to dating, the you know, and this is something that would be pan generational, is that you want to be considerate to the person you are with and you are you are seeking as a prospective date. That's really, I think, if you follow that kind of golden rule, regardless of whether you're 15 or 95, the the um, you really are going to be doing the right thing. The the modus that you use to actually gain that date that's certainly changed, and that's something that is going to be very generational and very cultural too. Well, you mentioned Facebook texting and the like, and as you point out, uh, people under 30 or under 20 have an entirely different set of rules uh, when it comes to that. Um, and I hope later when we take calls that you hear from some listeners who are under or around 20. Uh, in the meantime, what do both of you uh, notice about the dating habits of younger people? Are they very different from people of the older generations? I think that they are much more relaxed. You know, they, they rely on texting and they rely on Facebook and Skype. So they are they are using that as one of their major means of communication. So I don't think they think anything of texting. Instead of asking face-to-face for a date with someone, they can text and say, would you like to go out on Friday? And, and I certainly don't think they're doing it to be disrespectful. It's just their means of conversation. Are, are the rules different in different parts of the world, uh, different parts of the country anyway? Uh, uh, would they be different in New York than they are in Texas, other than bringing a gun to a date in New York is generally frowned upon? <laughs> and Texas, too, hopefully. <laughs> I bet. Yes, they are. <laughs> well, I think, you know, the, the bottom line, Thomas is correct. It's, it, a date is based on, you know, mutual interest, and hopefully they're going to grow into a relationship. That's what they're looking for. And I think it, it uh, is always important to like that person. And you can't know if you like them without asking them out on a date. So there's these there's particular rules, you know, these guidelines. And do you, you don't want to play games with someone. You don't want to say, if someone asks you out, you don't want to say, well, oh, gosh, I've, I've got to wash my hair. Oh, uh, I'm busy. And then they see you out. I think it's about being honest. And up front. People do that because they don't want to give up too much control. Uh, playing hard to get, not calling back, saying you're busy so as to seem like you're not too available. Those are all things that uh, make people f- uh, allow people to feel that uh, they're not seeming too eager. That's right. And, and you also, you know, nobody wants to play the villain. You know, it's, it's very hard to tell somebody the truth. No, I really don't want to go out with you because I'm not interested in you. So I think there are two things at play. One is the, you know, I'm not such an easy catch. Let's not pretend that I am. Um, but the flip side is you, you don't want to be letting people down too hard. So I think a lot of times people substitute these kind of flimsy excuses as a means of saving the other person's feelings. Diane, in heterosexual dating, men are usually expected to make the first move to ask the woman out. For many men, that's the most difficult part of the process. What's the best way to do that? Oh, that's right. You know, men can be shy, just like women can be shy, as they can be assertive as well. So I think that, you know, historically women have always been the ones to sit back, and it wasn't only until recently that women became more assertive. So if a man or a woman wants to ask someone out on a date, just be forthright and say, you know, I'd I'd love to take you out to dinner, or I would love for you to join me for dinner on Friday. Are you available? But there's a difference between saying, hey, let's let's get together for a bite versus would you like to go out? You know, you're sending a a mixed message, and it's so you want to be clear as to what you're asking. And if you just say, let's go out for a bite because you just want to feel the other person out? That just might seem as if you want to take them out as a friend. You know, there's a, there's a difference between dating and socializing. And when you're – certainly it overlaps. But in a social setting, you know, you can go to a ball game and sit next to a stranger or you can have lunch with a friend. But when you are asking someone out on a date, it's normally an indicator that you want to get to know them better. And people send off all kinds of signals when they do go on that first date. How they dress, for example, if uh, you dress – too well, you might feel that you're making this seem like it's too important. If you dress too casually, you make it seem like it doesn't really matter much to you. That's true. And I think traditionally this is something that, that women, um, if we're speaking in broad strokes, um, tend to think about probably a lot much more than, than the man does. The man, you know, puts his outfit together without thinking very much about it, whereas very, very often the woman, you know, might have gone through five or six outfit changes before she's actually decided what to wear for the night. Diane, you work with executives in your practice. Should one ever date a colleague, someone from the same office, someone who works for you? Well, those are several different questions in that one question. We just spend so much time at work that it's easy to develop 
a relationship with someone that we respect. So, and especially if we're equal, you know, in peer, in ranking, but it's always risky, you know, so we have to check the corporate policy. You know, if they say, if they frown on it or if they say that you can't do it, then you're already you're already at risk with your livelihood. So, but there's definitely some do's and don'ts, Leonard. You know, you number one, check that office policy. But also, you need to think about the end right at the beginning because you have to think: if I get involved with someone, what's going to happen? If and when we we break up, if it's nasty, if there's gossip, you know, you have to decide how much of a risk you're willing to take. And then we read in the newspapers about people who go out with uh, people they do business with. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's all it's all. <laughs> Pardon the term. It's all a crapshoot. You don't know until you do. And, and now, here's one. I, this is one thing that I discourage: is a sub, a subordinate dating their boss, or vice versa, the boss asking out an employee, because you're asking for trouble. You know, so um, I'm not saying it could never ever work, but the chances that it will work and it will be comfortable, it's it's it's, a, it's questionable. Because there's a power inequity there. Yes, and people are going to frown on it and say that you are receiving special treatment. And then if you break up with, let's say, if the boss breaks up with the girlfriend the, or the boyfriend, you know, whoever is in power, they can file a, a, a harassment suit if, if they, they, they may or may not formulate something that may or may not be true. You know, it's just it's sticky business. My guests are Diane Gutzman, an etiquette expert and owner of the Protocol School of Texas, and Thomas P. Farley a manners and lifestyle expert, author of a book called What Manners Most. Uh, So, Thomas, what are the most common mistakes people make? Well, I think certainly getting back to the uh, the digital arena for a second, because that is just so much a part of what dating is about today. I think particularly if we're speaking about the younger generation, it is relying on the technology um, as a substitute for genuine face-to-face conversation. I mean, I remember, you know, you know the the butterflies in my stomach i felt asking a girl to a prom in high school and how difficult that was to you know to pick up the phone and you know and staring at the dial and you know that's all gone that's all gone um and i think in the same way that the news cycle has been so compressed the 24 hour news cycle that we all live in whereas an event that happened 6 hours ago might seem like it happened an eternity ago the same things happen with dating so the idea of courtship as it was known in the victorian era is completely out the window. Well, there, there's uh, you go on this first date, and then you decide you want to have a second date. Does do the rules change? Second, third date etiquette. Again, I think it all comes back to kindness and consideration. Well, what about who pays? Right. Well, there's you know that's that's something that that can be very regional. Certainly uh, here in New York, you you do see women in particular who feel very, you know, no compunction whatsoever about asking a man to, you know, to go somewhere for dinner, to uh, grab drinks. And I, and I think what I like to advise is that if uh, the woman has been the asker, she should at least offer to treat for the drinks. Um, And then the man should, he should still certainly at least go halfway. Diane, you wanted to add to that. That's right. The protocol is you invite, you pay, and you tip. You know, that's going by the letter of the law. But Thomas is absolutely right. You know, there are women now, we, we make the same amount of money as as men. And some women would take offense. Others would not. So you really have to feel the situation, you know. And, uh, and certainly, if you invite someone out, as a woman, if you invite, if you invite a man out and he offers to pay, you can you can either say thank you so much, or you could say look, this is my treat. You you can you can do it next time. So I do think in that regard the rules have changed or have have relaxed a bit. But you know I was talking to a few people just just last night um, that are out in the dating world, and the the men have this. They still are in a quandary. They say, well, we don't know. You know, people still do not quite grasp what to do when that bill comes. You certainly don't want to let it sit on the table like a ticking time bomb. I can tell you that. What about at the end of that first date when it's a that one of the people would like to develop a relationship, the other one doesn't have much interest in continuing. How does that person handle it without being cruel? I mean, most people will just simply say, okay, let's get together again and then never call. But uh, that seems cruel to me. You know, let's get together again is, is often used as a filler. Well, call me or I'll call you. So rather than saying, if you know that you don't want to see her again or him again, rather than saying, let's get together again, just say, you know, this was a really, I had a really nice time. I appreciate you taking me out. 
that that sends a signal. And if they pursue it, if they say, well, would you like to go out again, just be honest and say, you know, I think you're a, a great person. I just... I'd be willing to be friends, but I don't want to let you. I don't want you to think that this could go on any further, and as far as a date. That sort of honesty really is is at the crux of what good manners is all about. You know, on the on the one hand, again, it seems like you might be sparing somebody's feelings, but what you're really doing is you're you're setting them up for later dejection by giving them this big expectation. On the other hand, if you say to them, you know, this is just I, I like you very much, but it's really not the relationship I want. That's cruel. It can be hurtful. I mean, nobody wants to hear those words. But again, far better that than have somebody think, oh, my gosh, this is the person of my dreams. And, and this is about to be the, the relationship I've longed for all these years. Um, you know, why, why set somebody up for that expectation? We're going to take a little break now. And when we come back, we'll be taking calls and also uh, reading some of the things that people write in on our show page at WNYC.org. Our phone number here is 646 646- Eight two nine three nine eight five. That's six four six eight twenty nine thirty nine eighty five. We have to talk about uh, whether we even discuss sex in this conversation here, and uh, about uh, perhaps uh, when uh, people start talking about uh, if a relationship has to be exclusive or not. And we want to hear what you're thinking about. Again, the number six four six eight two nine three nine eight five. We're back with Thomas P. Farley, a manners and lifestyle expert. Uh, His website is What Matters Most, and he has written a book called Modern Manners. Uh, And we also have Diane Gottsman, who's an etiquette expert and owner of the Protocol School of Texas. And we're talking about dating etiquette on today's Please Explain and taking your calls at 646-829-3985. That's 646-829-3985. Or you can also... Uh, leave a comment on our show page at WNYC.org. And a listener wondered uh, on our show page, why is the United States is dating as entrenched and why in other countries is it more relaxed? The listener says in France, there's no real word for dating. Interesting. You know, I think it's dating is such a big part of American pop culture. You know, the idea of, and you know, it's certainly so glorified in movies, the idea of courtship and love and, um, you know, going out on dates and finding the person who just is going to make you gloriously happy, I think does tend to be a very American concept. I think he's right about that. Let's take a call. Uh, Cody from Englewood, New Jersey. Hi, you're on the air. Hi. um, I just want to talk about um, my view on the effect of technology in the dating world, I guess, for teenagers, maybe in America. Um, I think that um, an aspect that people, especially older people, don't necessarily realize is that, um, you know, it really is part of our lives, technology, you know, Facebook, Skype, Twitter, um, BlackBerry Messenger. And, you know, when you're out, even face-to-face with another person, I think that, you know, you're on your phone, you're seeing on Facebook or on MySpace what other friends are doing, and you're putting effort into reacting to that situation as opposed to putting effort into the situation you're in with the actual individual you're with. And I feel like that's something that our society is doing a lot more of, and I'm not sure it's necessarily a good thing. Cody, how old are you? I'm 19. I turned 19 in October. Well, uh, Cody, you're absolutely right about that. I've, I've seen instances, too, where people are, are actually tweeting about or Facebook posting about a date that's currently in progress. And you yeah. think, gosh, wow, you know, this was, you know, was I that boring that the person, you know, <laughs> felt the need to, you know, whip out their iPhone or their BlackBerry and start talking about the date before it was even over? So, um, yeah, I, I think technology lowers the bar for people reaching out to one another, getting to know one another, and that's great. I think that's to be applauded, and I think certainly for the younger generation, it's, it's something that is the norm, and for that reason, I'd have no issues with it manners-wise. Where it gets tricky is um, where people do forget the importance of the face-to-face, and you get people, say, breaking up by text message. And I think there's so much context that gets lost in text messaging or in an, even an email that if they had just taken the time to speak person to person, it would not have happened. So is it an act of cowardice to write a, an email to someone and say, you know, this is not working out? I think cowardice is partly to blame, but I think also it's, it's the way, it's the lingua franca of the younger generation. They don't, 
the idea of picking up a telephone and calling someone is it's just a very strange concept. It's all, you know, little quick bursts of messages, and that's, that's the way the younger generation prefers to communicate on all levels. Diane? Well, and another, another dilemma is we often, especially the, the younger, even the teens, we let our friends use our, our cell phones. So they are texting and they are sending pictures that, that are on our phone and they don't even belong to us. So we have to be very careful how we use the social media in general. But I still just think, I mean, call me old-fashioned, I just don't think you should break up with anyone over a text. Um, it's, I just think they uh, deserve more respect than that. And, Cody, do you have anything you want to add before I go on to another call? No, um, I, I completely agree with, with what everyone said. I think a great um, example of that is um, from that George Clooney movie, um, Up in the Air, with uh, that scene where the, his colleague got broken up over text messages. a great example of, one, a generation gap between, you know, older people in our country and younger people and just the points of view on that. So I totally agree. And, and nowadays they were, you can't imagine Neil Sedaka writing Breaking Up is Hard to Do. <laughs> it's just, he would say, you know, just text. Let's take another call. This is from, uh, is it Ty? Tal? Ty? Tal. Tal from Riverdale. Hi, Tal. You're on the air. Hi. How are you? Okay. What about you? So I went out on a date with a fellow a few years ago, and we started out, it was just to get some coffee, and he, it, it seemed to be going very well. He said, you know, why don't we go have dinner? I know this really lovely place. And he took me to a really nice restaurant, and we had a great time. We laughed, and we made eye contact, and we told each other stories, and I felt like there was a good balance, and it seemed really nice. And at the end of the date, he drove me to where I had parked my car, and he said, I had a really great time. I'll give you a call. And I said, okay, that was marvelous. I got in my car, I got home, and I shot a quick text over saying, thanks so much, I really enjoyed myself. And he sent me a text back saying, me too, I'll give you a call. And I never heard from him again. So well, you, how could I have known that, like, that it wasn't as great to him? You couldn't have known. You know, you can only go by what you see and what you hear and what you feel. And it sounds like you were having a really good conversation and you had good communication and uh, it felt right. So you don't know what happened on his end. You never know. So you can't second guess him and certainly you can't second guess yourself. So you just have to think, chalk it up to experience and um, because you'll really never know on his side what happened. I don't know that he was playing games. He just, maybe something happened on his right. end. And I don't mean something happened to him, but a, a maybe a, his right wife away. found out that he was <laughs> out on the date. Who knows? It could be all sorts of things. But I, I would say good riddance uh, because uh, the least he could have done is said, you know, something's come up. I'm leaving town. Uh, yeah, I really, I totally agree with you. I mean, I didn't pursue it, but I just scratch my head every once in a while. I said, this is the weirdest thing. So right. I think you're you're asking a question that women have been asking themselves for generations. And, you know, getting back to something that Diane said earlier, I think there is this tendency, whether male or female on a date, to end with, I had a great time, I'll, I'll call you. And it's kind of this knee-jerk uh, line that people say, even if they don't really mean it. Now, we don't know the circumstances of this particular date, what was going on in, in the guy's mind. But I think a lot of times that, that line is used, even if it's not meant entirely, just simply because people don't know how to end a date otherwise. Let's take another call. Uh, Jim from Bayside. Hi, you're on the air. Hi. Um, after my divorce, I used the internet, uh, Match.com, JDA, et cetera, and I went on more than, um, more than 100 dates. I wonder, what's, what, what, what do you, in your opinion, what you think would be the proper thing to do when they don't look like their picture or they lie about their age or their profession or something like that? Were you totally honest? Me? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay. 100%. Recent photos of the work. Which one of you wants to answer that? Well, I'll, I'll jump in, and Thomas, you, you jump in whenever you want. Sure. I will tell you that if you show up and see your date and she has aged about 20 years from her picture, that's an indicator for you right there that there's more of that to come. You know, because we, if she wasn't honest about that, she's probably not going to be honest about things going forward. So, you know, have a, have a nice, quick time, close the conversation, you know, after a, a significant period of time, you know, maybe 30 minutes or so, and then just move on. They just, there's no guarantee that people are going to be honest, but we, you are going to be found out. I think it's really important to be as upfront and honest with people as possible. Without giving, 
on the date too much information. You know, but, and but, that's there, a- but Diane, there's another side, isn't there? Sometimes people, uh, if you give the real age, uh, that could be uh, could be a turnoff. Even though you really are very young, uh, you don't look your age. You sure don't feel your age. But some people have you know, hard Leonard, and fast I- rules. I still wouldn't lie. I mean, you can you can get around it. You can uh, you might just even opt to say nothing. But I I wouldn't lie. You know, a lie is still a lie. It's still a deception. I I would agree with Diane there. And I think too, as far as the photograph goes, I have no issue with you putting up a photo of you looking your best on your best day. But that best day better not have been twenty years ago. That's right. Let's take another call, and this is from Gail from the East Side of Manhattan. Hi, Gail. Hi, how are you? Uh, my question is very basic. I've met somebody on a chat line, and I spend part of uh, my time in Florida. He's in Florida, and um, about to go down there. And what I found in Florida that has me very dismayed is that you know it's true that I haven't been much in the in the dating circle for several years, but. They really expect to have sex on the first day. Now, how do I cope with that? Well, you don't. You don't have to cope with it. You always have the option of saying no. So, if that is going to be the deal, the deal killer, that's really not the person you want to be with anyway. If you're not comfortable, you certainly should not be pressured into doing anything you you don't want to do, and you oh, are well, not I'm comfortable. Not, I'm, I'm usually usually I'm not, but I what I can do is I I say it in advance, and that's like, um, (laughs) you know, if you expect that, you know, we're going to be intimate on the first date, I prefer not to be. And what do they say? How do they respond? Well, my favorite was um, a guy who started necking with me or trying to neck with me, and I told him, you know, this, uh, you know, when I first meet you, this isn't going to go anywhere. Uh, we can keep kissing, but, you know, etc. cetera. I, I didn't exactly put it like that. Yeah. And after a while, he said, you know, I have something for you down in my car. Let me go get it. And he was really funny. He never came back. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Thank your lucky stars. That's right. Good, red, good riddance. <laughs> That's right. Well, what do you mean? I, 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 I thought it, but I'm really trying to... Devon, yeah, I know I don't have to do anything, but I just feel, on the one hand, overwhelmed and surprised and dismayed. I mean, the price of honesty is no dates, apparently. And, oh, I, I don't really think that every man expects to have sex on the first date. So uh, if, if that's, if that's the, uh, the, the going to be the deciding factor, well, obviously you really – and for you, some other woman might very well be very happy to have sex with that man on the first date. And different people have different rules, don't they? I think this is one of the pratfalls, again, of digital dating is that everything is happening in such a compressed cycle. So whereas before you might have had the opportunity to get to know him and you knew his friends and you were getting together in groups and then finally on dates where your comfort level might have been a little bit different, this is all you're, – you're meeting somebody for the first time who you've never seen and, you know, all these expectations are being put out on the table. Um, so I think it's definitely, you know, the digital – dating dilemmas are, are myriad. We, we love the advantage that we have of being able to get introduced to people so quickly, but it means sometimes we wind up fixed up with people we don't necessarily match with. Remember our number here, it's 646-829-3985. That's 646-829-3985. You can also leave a comment on our show page at wnyc.org. We're talking about the, uh, the etiquette of dating or dating etiquette with Thomas P. Farley and Diane Gotsman. And let's go now to uh, Barry from the East Village. Hi, Barry. You're on the air. Hey, how you doing? Actually, the last call was kind of similar to mine, but I'll ask it from the male perspective. Um, I find that, you know, compared to an old Cary Grant movie where, you know, the man and the woman are on the date and they're, you know, they're trying to see if there's a connection and, uh, you know, the man is judging the woman's signals. I find now that... If you're like that, forget about it. Um, You will quickly be thrown into the friend category because women expect that the guys are going to be aggressive. So it's kind of difficult if you're a guy who really, you know, and you're not even going to want to try to kiss a woman until you know she's really maybe interested. 
Uh, that's just not the norm now. So I just wonder what the uh, wait. Wait. How old are the women are. you're going out with? How old are they? Um, I guess you know maybe in the early thirties. So are we talking about generational changes here? The woman in her sixties might very well have a very different take on this, don't you? Think? Right. I think the younger the younger they are, the more they're just used to the a situation now where things are going to happen fast. Just like a movie, there's going to be special effects and car crashes early on in the movie because people have a short attention span. The younger they are, I think, the bigger this is a problem. So I'm saying this actually can hurt some of the guys who are actually more, shall we say, gentlemanly. I think what ends up happening with a lot of these uh, relationships is they have sex really quick, and the next thing you know, the women are like, I don't know, it just happen but it didn't just happen it was uh you know really i think they need to step up a little bit more and say what they want and what they're actually thinking i think it would help everything um because again a lot of guys do behave pretty badly diane uh, do you uh, have and any thoughts know, on I'm, this i'm just sitting here thinking there are so many different you know it's all individualized because we can't really generalize all women in their 30s so Again, I think it has a lot to do with the connection that you make, and and uh, is the woman sending mixed signals? Are you coming across um, shy, and is she feeling like she needs to to help you along? You know, it's it's all. I think it's situation to situation. Are you feeling uncomfortable as if they're they're too aggressive or assertive for you, Barry? No, I like that. I think that like women it. should be more like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, good. I just you're not like complaining. Have... You're just confused. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the big question the is... ...and have to initiate everything, it seems like. And it seems like it's even more... You would think it's less like that, but I find it's actually, in a city like New York, even more like that. So, Thomas, is that what you find? What do you find? I, I, would, I would agree there. I think, you know, certainly there are going to be lots of women in New York in their early 30s who would love that Cary Grant character. So if that's who you are and who you want to be, I would not give up hope. But I do think, uh, particularly in urban settings, you get that kind of where you've got a professional woman. She knows what she wants, and she's ready to take charge. And, uh, you know, if you are, are her prey, she's going to go for it, and she's not going to wait for you to take action. And it doesn't hurt if you look like Cary Grant, and she looks like Grace Kelly. <laughs> That's right. Uh, that would be a good mix. <laughs> Sheila from Ocean, New Jersey. Hi, you're on the air. Hi. I, I called because um, I, too, an old, am an older woman, and I didn't hear the previous person who was, but um, I know two very kind and loving men, and I like them both, and I have been honest with the, each of them about how I feel, which is not exactly the same degree of... Um, lovingness as they however i i like them a lot i care about them and enjoy their company a lot and i continue to see both of them uh but i don't see either of them very often because one of them lives out of town and the other one i have drawn some boundaries so i don't know whether i am wrong uh to continue to try to have a relationship with these people um because... well let, let me jump in because we don't have a lot of time what would you yeah. like the relationship to be like are, are you talking about being friends with these men do you I want do. it to be romantic yeah. would you like sex to be part of it somewhere down the line or would you have to be married before you would no i wouldn't have, sex? have to be married i wouldn't it, you know, it sounds like everybody knows the situation. You've been honest with both of them. They both know about each other, that you see two suit, two different men, or you, they do not know about each they other? They don't. Ah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you know. I'm um, I am on the radio. God. <laughs> that's right. Maybe they won't recognize your voice. You know, it has to be something that's comfortable, and I'm not even going to ask you if you're having sex with both of them. And But, you know, there is something to be said about monogamy, and, and normally, unless they just really don't care, they probably think they're in an in individual relationship with you. So um, there's something that's keeping you from both of them. You have to think about what that is. And there is a time when you have to decide whether you want to have a monogamous relationship. Uh, often one person uh, starts insisting on it while the other person is still looking around, and that, that can destroy the relationship, or, or the other person has to decide whether they want to continue looking or whether this, this person who's insisting on monogamy is worth it. They may think they're in a monogamous relationship with you. Mm -hmm. you may, but somewhere along the line, people figure out that, you you know, there's a reason you're not available on Wednesdays. 
<laughs> and this is this is the thing. I think you know nothing wrong with dating a few people, playing the field, but you really do want to be honest. Um, you're only setting yourself and and them up for later hurt if you're not honest. Just one more call, Ken from Pennsylvania. Hi, you're on the air. Hi, I just want to say I love your show. By the way, I, I've. I'm a truck driver, and I'm back and forth to Long Island six days a week from Pennsylvania. And uh, I tell you what, WNYC gets me through my day every day. Oh, so, thank you so much. I, I wanted to tell you that I've heard a lot of these Internet horror stories have, you know, on the air today. And I, my wife and I met in a Yahoo chat room almost 12 years ago. And I was living in Pennsylvania. Uh, actually, I was living in British Columbia with uh, helping my parents out at the time. I traveled uh, to Pennsylvania. 3,300 miles on a Greyhound bus. Never met my wife before. And we met, uh, we've met for the first time at the end of August, and we were married October 2nd. We have three kids, and we've never looked back, and it's been great. Oh, so that's a great success are, story. Yeah, there are but, but isn't it just a matter there. of luck? I mean, do you, it doesn't matter how experienced you are. If you just don't meet the right person at the right time, uh, it, it, it doesn't work out. He he was lucky, wasn't he? I think the web. And she was lucky too. She sounds like she was very lucky. I think the web opens up just so many options for all of us, and that's a great thing. You know, always always good to inc- increase your odds. But along with increasing those odds, you're setting yourself up for more things gone wrong. Um, so I think as long as we bear that in mind as we, as we tread into digital dating, knowing that it shows great promise and it removes a lot of the barriers to entry, but that there will also be a lot of dis- disappointments along the way. Last word from you, Diane? I would just say don't rely solely on any one avenue. You know, you can be on these uh, sites, but also look at other avenues as well. Get into get involved in groups and clubs and go to church and see if there's any clubs there as well. And friends sometimes do know somebody right. who's good for you. That's right. Thank you both so much for being with us. Diane Gotsman is an etiquette expert and owner of the Protocol School of Texas. And Thomas P. Farley, uh, he has a, a website called what manners most he also has a book called modern manners and thank you both for being on our show today thank you thank you it was a pleasure Thanks for listening to WNYC On Demand. Please check out the other programs at WNYC.org or on iTunes. This is a free service made available by our listeners. Become a member of WNYC today.